Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Lisa. Hey, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm truly honored to be on such a prestigious podcast. Oh, well, thank you. And I'm excited. You're famous. You You are so famous. And now when my kids see this, they're going to be like, mom, really? (laughs) That is so funny. That is awesome. I'm so excited to have you here, too. I mean, you're a supply chain veteran and famous in your own right. Plus, we're releasing this episode on International Women's Day, which is really, really cool. We've deviated from our consistent Monday podcast and made sure that we were releasing this on that special Friday. And you're a woman after my own heart because you have a commitment to empowering women. You put yourself out there on boards, speaking opportunities. So if any event organizers are listening, Lisa is your lady. I'm here. I'm here. (laughs) And you're really helping to move the needle, which we all love to see on the show. So I want to find out a lot more about you. So let's just dive right in. And we're going to start at the very beginning. I think your education was in IT. You began your career in sales and customer service for IT companies. So the big question is, how did you end up in supply chain? Yeah, it was really kind of strange because back in the day, there was no such thing as supply chain, right? So I uh, grew up in Vermont. Um, It's an IBM town in small town Vermont. Um, I got my degree in programming and then um, moved down south of here for a little bit and ended up at a software city. Um, And in Software City, I was tasked with building leading edge computers. So this was before Dell came in to play. So this small mom and pop shop needed somebody to put the computers together um, and then load all the software and then train all the people. And so I thought, well, that's fun. So my whole life has just been one big oh, I'll try that. That's fun. Oh, I'll try that. But I fell kind of in love there, moved to California. And that's when I got really introduced into big scale manufacturing and supply chain. So that's how I stumbled into where I am today. I love that. So let's talk about that because you're currently the vice president of supply chain strategy and it's called Alum, right? Alum. And so, ALOM, yes. And so, yeah, uh, ALOM stands for, it's an acronym, actually. Um, Not a lot of people know this, so I'm out there educating on the acronym, too. So it stands for Advanced Logistics Operations and Manufacturing. Um, When the company was started uh, 26 years ago, um, we needed to come up with a name um, that would be placed first on the Google search list this was before paid to play right so we had to have an a and then we're really big on acronyms so um that's what it stands for and um what we do uh, most people think of us as a 3pl um but we're really not we're kind of a unicorn in the space we do light contract manufacturing final configuration hardware flashing package assembly kitting vendor managed inventory fulfillment, warehousing, returns, reconfiguration, um, and recycling of those returns, because we're really big on the full circular supply chain. Um, We're operating out of 19 global locations, um, serving the high compliance industries, um, such as medical, automotive, technology, and then the regulated industries. Um, I have really strict NDAs. Um, so I'm going to try and, and 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 do this without disclosing who my contacts are so I don't get in trouble. Um, but if you've ever driven in a car with navigation that's on compact flash, that's us. Um, if you've ever taken a DNA test, which many, many, many of us have, um, that's probably um, where we support that vertical and it's most likely our customer. Um, if you during the pandemic then. Uh, We were super busy during the pandemic because if you've ever taken a high-end flu test or COVID test, we produce those. Um, And then if you have a device, I've put my devices away. Um, But if you have a device that you can wear or talk on the phone with, we support uh, that industry as well. And so that's kind of who ALOM is in a nutshell. Thank you for sharing that. Now, were you a founding member then? 
I am one of the original employees. I'm not a founder, so no, I would like, never. I like <laughs> yeah. Employees. Like you were one yes. Of them yes. 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 I should have kept all my badges, but I didn't. <laughs> so how did that end up happening? That you decided after everything that you've done before this that you were gonna dive in as one of the first employees. Well, again, I kind of lucked into this is the story of my life. Um, I love your tagline. I was born to do this. Well, I think I was too. Um, and so it's been, uh, it was, it was kind of crazy. So I was working at that contract manufacturer when I first moved to California and I just had my um, first child, my daughter, Meg. Um, she was just a baby and I was working at this place. It was five minutes from my house. I drive home, I breastfeed her at lunch and I loved my role there, but I had this headhunter and he kept calling me. He's like, Lisa, you need to talk to this person. Um, you're going to love her. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm really happy where I'm at. I got a baby. I go home at lunch. It's great. And he's like, no, no, no. You've got to talk to this woman. And so this is when I got introduced to Hannah Kane, who hadn't started ALOM yet. So this is an ALOM. She was tasked with starting up a facility in the Bay Area for a company out of Sacramento. And so I met with her and I was completely blown away with her vision for supply chain um, because no one 28 years ago was talking about, um, you know, data and visibility and traceability and portals. And so I went, oof. And again, I was the sole support for my family. So I was like, ooh, do I take a chance? This, I was in 200,000 square feet and she was tasked with starting up 25,000. And so I was like, really? Then I went, oh my God. But after meeting her, I was like, I really got to take a gamble. So I hemmed and hawed and then I rolled the dice and went great. Um, and so Hannah was, was fabulous. Um, then we'd worked there for about a year and then she decided I can do so much better than this. And she could. Um, and so yeah. she said, I'm going to start my own company. Would you consider going with me? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> it's been a fun ride so far. So I took another gamble, rolled the dice, and here we are 26 uh, years later. We started out with just 50,000 square feet. Now we're in three buildings uh, in Northern California with uh, close to 500,000 square feet total. Uh, we opened up an indie facility three years ago, and that's almost 200,000 square feet. And yeah, it's just been kind of a wild ride. Amazing. So talk to us about your journey with ALOM, right? Because I'm sure your roles have kind of evolved over the years. Talk us through how your career progressed through that time. And what did you learn along the way? I mean, I'm sure you've learned so much. Oh my God, so much. And so I've done pretty much every role. I'm not doing IT. I've never done IT. We have amazing in-house IT. So I don't want I don't want to take any credit for our amazing IT. Um, but I've done every role um, you know, that that you can imagine. It's just been an in incredible journey because when you start and it's a, it's a few people, everybody pitches in, you roll your sleeves up, we're going to get stuff done, we're going to get stuff made. Right. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to touch pretty much everything. And so now my role, I'm VP of supply chain strategy and in my role is really in what I love is around um, strategic planning and really helping our clients align their supply chain from raw materials to right shoring and then closing out that loop when, you know, products do get returned uh, or have failures out in the field and those types of things. So yeah. yeah, it's a lot of fun. I love that. It's kind of similar to my journey because um, I worked for the family business and was able to touch all sorts of parts of the business, you know, learn finance, but be in imports and exports and customs and warehousing and really sort of find what I liked, what I didn't like, you know, what I was good at, yeah. what I wasn't what good you're at. good at, what you, yeah, because it's the stuff that you like that you're really good at, right? <laughs> you move on fast, the stuff that you don't like. Yeah, and I <laughs> That's why I'm not in programming to this day. I mean, it was mind numbing for me personally. Yeah. I'd rather be out there building stuff, but you know, yeah. No, that's I why I, I can hear your passion and it sounds like you've really found your place I mean you've been there and they've kept you there for 26 years which is amazing they don't know how to get rid of me it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> 
they're like, oh, oh let's find another you. challenge. <laughs> they are so lucky to have you. So talk to us about how you've seen the industry change over that time, right? I think that this question is getting more and more interesting, the more open and honest we kind of get about it, right? A few years ago, <sighs> people would say, ah, oh, it's changed so much. We've come so far. But actually, more recently, people are saying, you know what? We're still facing a lot of the same challenges as we were 20 years ago. Um, and thinking back to what Hannah was talking about 26 years ago or 27 years ago before you started, you know, talking about data and portals and all of that, what's your perspective on this? Because you had the opportunity to be with somebody who was so forward thinking in a mm -hmm. industry that really is not. And then to really think about how that's transitioned and changed over the last 20, 26 years. Have we really made a lot of progress? Have we not? You know, what do you think? Well, I do think we've made a lot of, of progress. And what I love about Hannah is she's very right brain and left brain. And and what we've done as an organization is, is use technology prudently, right? Because there's some places for technology and there's other places that there is no place for technology. But I think the industry really has indeed transformed dramatically with digitalization, globalization, innovation. Um, but then we also, despite all those advancements, we still have issues with disruption that we can't control. Um, that's never gonna go away. Geopolitical tensions we can't fix, pandemics. Um, it really kind of underscored the fragility of our supply chains that we haven't, we thought we were really robust and, right. and in fact, we weren't. Um, and while tech has provided tools for better risk management, the interconnected nature and how we're all integrated and all of this visibility, the minute one piece breaks, mm -hmm. we're, we're left with this cascading effect and it, it's, yeah. it's still not fixed, right? And then I think the other issue we have is the rapid pace of tech has changed, but now it's created a skills gap. Right. So we're all fighting for the same people, right? That have the, you know, it's a very small pool and we're all wanting and, and it's it's tough these days. And so this gap kind of handcuffs our ability to fully leverage all these great new tech tools because we need the people who know how to use them and use right. them properly. And then all the digitization also exposed um, risk with, you know, cyber attacks, supply chains, you know, have the greater impact of cyber attacks that can shut us all down. So, you know, you two steps forward, yeet, one step back, and then um, sustainability has made some great progress. You know, it's become a critical concern for everybody. Um, and while there is this growing awareness, regulatory pressure, consumer demand, um, it's it's because we're all fully integrated, we're all expected to come up, but it's a huge lift. And some of our suppliers aren't ready to do that with us. And right. so, yeah, it's it's been a fun ride. Well, we always talk about supply chain professionals being problem solvers. But what you yes. just described, I kind of feel like we are jugglers as well. We are jugglers. That's it. It's like adapt. <laughs> Learn, adapt, learn again. <laughs> Don't drop the ball. <laughs> well, and so one of the things that you said about um, skills, and it's interesting because I read a recent article and we talked about it recently on Boston Coffee, is that one of or two of the biggest skills that organizations are looking for right now is creative thinking and analytical thinking as well. So you're talking mm -hmm. about, I think, skills on the technology side because we need to be able to implement and adopt and you know, really configure what the technology uh, structure is around a supply chain. But then organizations are also looking for creative thinking and analytical thinking, which yes. supply chain professionals bring to the table. Yeah, because every day is different for us, right? If if you're not strategically thinking, you're not a business the next day, right? Yeah, <laughs> because, never. you know, the one rule of thumb, nothing goes as planned mm -hmm. and you better have a backup. <laughs> So true. Don't I know that as an entrepreneur? Um, uh -huh. and then I think the, the other part of it, though, too, is I feel like th we're just not there with data. No. Right? Because you were talking about Hannah talking about data like 27 years ago. And I feel like I am still talking about it, you know, six years it's... later into my podcast. 
career. And it's still so dynamic, right? So you have all this dynamic data. It's massive amounts of data. I was just at the Dimska conference with Hannah. She was um, speaking. Yay, woman on, on stage. Yay. Uh, so, you know, and that's, that. woohoo. So she it, and was engaging the audience because we're all talking about that generative AI and how do you deal with all of that? that dynamic data, it's like Niagara Falls coming in at us. And, you know, that's where I think AI is is definitely going to help um, us all as supply chain professionals, if used correctly in a closed loop to avoid data leaks, obviously, right? So there's so many other challenges, you know, that's a huge challenge coming up for, for the next two years because everybody's on the AI bandwagon but at the same time you know look we all have ndas in place one little iota gets leaked we're we're hosed mm, so we're not we're like open to collaboration but closed to collaboration we want to move forward but we can't move forward we can't move forward <laughs> yeah <laughs> you open your kimono and i'll open my kimono it's this weird symbiotic dance right and but it's true you know you you know you need to have some visibility, but at the same time, what can what data can you expose? So now we're dancers. Um, we're also dancers. so now we're dancers. So we're jugglers, yes. problem solvers, and dancers. Dancers. So you just I love about it. The future, um, kind of, and what what some of the biggest challenges will be for the next two years. And you said AI is going to be that. What mm -hmm. else do you see sort of coming down the pipe? And one quick note on AI as well is I feel like we tend to think macro with AI, where I've seen a lot more examples where uh, people are finding more success in sort of the micro, like the one process. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know. Automate and then go from there. Like somebody There's... I talked to you the other day, yeah. and I think it's coming up in an upcoming episode, 10 years to get to where they yeah. are with AI right now. So I mean, right. if you're not there, it's okay. It's okay. But you should be because it can help with a lot of the, the things that you need help with. And so you shouldn't be afraid of it. You should incorporate it and you should find some things. So, so I do, do think that is, is going to be a so, big play. So on top of AI, what are some of the other challenges and trends people should be sort of thinking about for 2024, 2025? So, you know, again, I go back to the global economy is facing uncertainties. And so demand planning is going to be a big challenge because the economies are slowing a little bit in the U.S. and China. And that's going to be a challenge. We all went through this big um, just we went from just in time to just in case. And we're still kind of in just in case. And now, you know, our our inventories are slightly bloated so to speak. Um, and so I think there's going to be that challenge of getting the right mix of products and inventory and raw material in, in the next couple, couple of years, mm -hmm. right? Because we did the pendulum swang so wildly from just in time to just in case. And so it, there's going to be a, a, a challenge there, the skills gap with the employees and in, in trying to get in um, that talent. I love, um, and it's so true, having people with critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, you, you can't teach that in school. It's, it's done on the shop floor, right? And yeah. so we all know that's just something you just, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I agree with you on um, both of those. I think that what we've seen is a lot of skews being cut though, as well, mm -hmm. right? I think people mm -hmm. have been since the pendulum swang one way, they've also been like, do we really need all these colors? Do we really need all these sizes? And so I, I'm, I'm guessing we're probably going to see some of that continue, right? Because so that'll can, inventory is costly, but I think what's happening though is, and it's something we help our customers with is, is having the ability, the consumer still wants to customize though. So yeah, you still do. want that Barbie pink um, and I do. And so the, it, it's that, again, that dance again of finding that right mix and then working with innovative solutions on it. Well, how can you still provide that while still cutting the skew? Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're doing a lot of final mile configuration at the last second so that you can keep the skew um, standard okay. and then customize at the end. Um, 
And so you still give those consumers the demand mm -hmm. that or the what they demand and want that mm -hmm. customization, but you do it at the final mile, you cut your skew down and then you find another way to make it unique. And so sure. that's what we're playing with. And so you've, you've got a lot of additive manufacturing that you can do that will allow for that customization, but you are correct. The, the SKUs have got to come down. They got crazy for a while. Yeah. And then I think, and it goes back to the data and this is where my programming background comes in. So I'm always looking at how do you call the number of steps and the data. And so don't, randomly create a skew you, there's ways to work around it and script around it so that you're doing you're cutting the skews down and yeah. the inventory down a little bit so that's well, and supply chain brains are going to be so um needed for all of that as well because you can partner with somebody like you too but you also need somebody yeah. internally that understands it so understands oh my god it. yes <laughs> you know it's <laughs> it's so needed and uh, it's interesting because people come to me all the time what should I upskill what should I look at well all of these episodes kind of give you a glimpse into what people mm -hmm. are thinking about what they're looking for what's coming down the line and what's so coming down to, the line to think uh, or to listen really really carefully because the information is out there so it you're is it really is about women in supply chain you said that you feel it's important to get the word out there for women that there is a place for them in the industry. So do you think that's part of the problem? Does supply chain have a branding issue? Do women feel like this space just isn't for them? I think we do have a branding issue and I don't know why it's so fun. It's amazing. And so <laughs> I think that's why, you know, your podcast and, and the PR that you're doing is absolutely amazing. It's important for women and diverse individuals to see that they have a seat at the table in yeah. supply chain, right? Supply chain encompasses every skill set. Mm -hmm. And so IT, engineering, planning, account management, sales, there's a spot for everyone. And there's room at the table for them. And so I applaud you for all that you're doing for the industry because it's fantastic. Well, thank you. And I, I think Part of that branding challenge, though, is that women do feel like we're a little bit braggy. And so we don't get out as much to really mm -hmm. talk about what this is all about and what it could mean for others and what impact that they can make in the world. Because really, supply chains make an impact on the world every single day. Every day. In a day. variety mm -hmm. of ways. Right. And I think we as women need to talk about it more. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> and so I challenge everybody. This was my challenge, I think, a couple of weeks ago when I saw a post. Damn it, don't challenge me. I have enough challenges, but you're right. I love it. <laughs> but I saw a post the other day. They were like, we need a series featuring women in supply chain. I was like, guess what? <laughs> Here it is. And I challenged. Don't find me. <laughs> I challenged all the people in the comments, and I was like, Go take a listen to some of the episodes mm -hmm. or read the blogs and whichever one resonates with you, post your comments about it and post that article or podcast on LinkedIn. Yes, yeah, repost it. I think it's important. Well, because not only are you giving a voice and showing what it's like to be women, you're also empowering that person who was featured in that episode or article to say, hey, we see you. Thank you for sharing yes. your story. Yeah, I agree a thousand percent. So That's challenge like accepted, challenge <laughs> accepted. Well, and so let's talk a little bit about some advice. What's some of your advice for women who might be interested in the industry, but they're not sure maybe what their career path might be, or perhaps they're intimidated by the seemingly male dominated environment? Yeah, so my advice would be to really reach out to your network to see who they know who might be in supply chain and get an introduction and then call them and pick their brain, right? And then, because that's a safe space. If if you can find another woman in supply chain, then call me, you know, you know, absolutely link in with me, but find another person in supply chain and pick their brain and find out and ask those questions that are important to you. Because like I said, pretty much every skill set's needed in supply chain and it's not as male dominated as they might think at all. I mean, look at Alom. We're woman owned, 100%, <laughs> and, you know, and 
it's incredibly, and our organization's incredibly diverse. And so, you know, it used to be, you know, people thought it was so male dominated and it was, I mean, don't get me wrong. I just didn't realize because I kind of grew up in a small town and it didn't matter whether you were a, a girl or a boy or whatever, it's just get it done. Um, so even back in the early days, no one blinked when I pulled the pallet jack through the warehouse, you know, and, and that's the case today too. You know, we have women doing every function, forklift drivers to truck drivers, and there's a place for women everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. And I would say, I would say resources, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to somebody on LinkedIn, Go and check out this woman in supply chain series, right? Go listen exactly. to their journey, figure out what kind of jobs that they've done. Even this episode, you've been able to share how you started, how you transitioned, and then what those positions look like throughout the journey. Um, and there's so much opportunity. There's the woman in supply chain uh, forum by supply and mm -hmm. demand chain that happens in November where women get together once a year, which is amazing. That's an amazing event. Yeah. Yeah. And they've, you know, they've sponsored this particular series as well because we help sponsor the forum. There's some collaboration happening now um, with some of those women in supply chain initiatives. You know, we've also got a virtual monthly meetup for women in supply chain because we realized that, you know, we want to meet up a little bit more than once a, once a year. Um, Correct. And so there's lots of things out there. There's, mm -hmm. there's lots of resources to tap into um, and really just get stuck in and figure out what it is that you like to do, don't like to do, right? So Yeah, because it's um, so much fun. It's just an amazing industry. And yeah, I, I yeah. couldn't imagine doing anything other than this. Yeah, well, and you mentioned about speaking opportunities. You're an amazing speaker. And getting women up on stage at events is vital. It's why I founded the Blended Pledge, so that we could help women and other underrepresented groups take opportunities and become visible, because representation matters. It so does. So what's your advice to organizations? Because recently there have been a couple of posts, and the posts have been by men either seeking women for potential panels up on stage or... Um, saying something about how we just don't put our hands up. And for anybody who saw any of those posts um, or is reading anything like that, can we just not, because I have a list of diverse voices that, who have raised their hands to say yes to speaking engagements. If there are any event organizers or you know of any, get them to DM me. I will send them that list because I feel like we just need to look a little bit harder. So what's they your advice to do. organizations? What do you think? So, yeah, it's a shame that in 2024, we do need the blended pledge still. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been at industry events and it's all white males speaking, you know, nothing against white males. Nope. Um, but I do love to see some diversity. Um, and like you, I keep hearing the same thing. There just aren't any diverse subject matter experts willing to get up and speak. And I say hogwash. Well, I say a few other choice words, but I'll say <laughs> hogwash today. You know, we're out here. There's women out here. And and I end up doing the same thing. I think corporations um, and organizations should be keeping a speaker bank of women and diverse employees that they have who are subject matter experts um, and that are comfortable speaking and offering them up to pave the way. Um, and behind that, they should be bringing up the next generation because it's a win-win for the corporations. It's great yeah. publicity, you know, and I don't understand why they're not doing it. You know, one thing I do after every event I attend and I don't see someone who is diverse on the panel mm -hmm. is I write in the comments, hey, I didn't see any women. I didn't see any diversity. You need to work on this. And here's my suggestion. I offer up speakers because they're usually at events that I'm attending where I have subject matter experts that I know. Right. Um, and then offer up my email, my telephone number and say, hey, call me. I'm happy to put you in touch with people who can get you speakers mm -hmm. for next year. And let's see a change. And I think everyone who attends an event, it's our money that's paying for the event. And so I think, you know, I think we'll get a seat at the table eventually. Oh, that's such a good point, right? Use your feedback dollars wisely. 
Yes. Do do the survey first of all. I do the survey every time. If I don't right. see somebody on there, boom. What yeah. what can we do to to make our event better? Well, oh, I'll tell you what you can do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let me ask you, how many people have contacted you? Um, I've had one actually. Oh, I thought you were gonna Yay. say zero. <laughs> yeah, no, I've had one. Yay. And I've offered them some some suggestions. Um, but again, I do think as women, we need to raise our hand and say, and, and again, it goes back to stretch. You got to stretch. It might not be comfortable for you. Start small, stretch, do a podcast, do a video podcast, right? Kind of get your feet wet, do a small um, CSCMP event um, or, you know, work your way up if you're not comfortable, but you know, and get involved. do it. It's get involved. There are, mm -hmm. there are resources out there. There are things that are out there yeah. that can that can definitely help you. But you're right. We do have to raise our hands. But we also need to put some pressure. Pressure on the others. Yep. Orga I am. Organizers. Um, Absolutely. Really open their eyes and, and see who's out there. See, see who's who can support, how they can support. One note on the organizations. I do agree that um, it would be great if we could see a little bit more participation for the divorce, diverse voices who want to have those kinds of opportunities in the mm -hmm. organizations. But it's also one of the reasons the Blended Pledge also has corporate sponsorships, because sometimes they have a lot of people. And so mm -hmm. to give them a way to be able to donate a, a corporate sponsorship, let their internal people know, let other people know that they've done that, and then they can apply and we can kind of do that for them, um, I think also helps as well. Um, because then we're all sort of collaborating, right? The organizations, exactly. the mm -hmm. nonprofits, the event organizers. But if you are offering feedback um, and you need that list of diverse voices, please just let me know and I'll give you access to it and you can share it with whoever you want. You can add people to it because we need to keep I would love to. to it. Um, so let's open that up once we're done. <laughs> And Perfect. Uh, let's, let's see what we can we can do. So you're an award winner, a speaker, a board member, a leader. What are you most proud of? What are some of the achievements that have defined your life and career? I think you're a woman in supply chain award winner too, right? I am and a step award winner. So I think the the achievement I'm the most proud of is my two incredible children, uh, Meg and Jake. They're amazing human beings that are on their own. It's fabulous. Um, but as far as achievements, I kind of felt like I made it when I was named um, Supply Chain Pro to know of the year um, and nice. was on the cover. I was a cover nice. person for the SDCE Supply Chain. I was like, oh my God. And that really was an incredible honor um, to, it, because the list of Supply Chain Pros to know was huge and amazing individuals. And when I was chosen, um, I was like, what? Really? Oh my God. <laughs> and so that was, that was, that was probably my, wow, I've made it. <laughs> that is awesome. So because we're releasing this on March 8th, the embargo is going to be lifted. And I just got my very own pros to know for 2024. See, good it, for it you. Go it's all, which is totally okay. But I did. It's okay. I've been trying to get on this list for three years, and I am so excited. I am so excited for you too. That's amazing. It's long overdue. The cover's yours next year. Ah! I mean, oh my God, we're gonna advocate for that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna advocate for that a hundred percent. So that's. But you know, it's 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 shocking. I don't know if I was. I don't know if they've ever had a woman on the cover before. Yeah. And so that was just like mind blowing to me. So I you're next. That. Well, thank you. I will like, honestly advocate for that all day long. We're here to celebrate you. And you know, that's, that's quite the achievement. The woman in supply chain awards. What else have you won? A step ahead award from the national association of manufacturers. Um, I've gosh, I try not to. I know, but there's a chance. Yeah, there's maybe. a lot. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, I've gotten some some great. Uh, 
I'd have to go and pull up my LinkedIn to be, yeah, I'm like, oh, I don't know. Well, you have so <laughs> many achievements and you continue to advocate for other people. Reach down, pull people up, um, yep. diverse voices, women. I mean, you even showcase that with using your feedback dollars, right? And mm -hmm. in those feedback surveys, you are doing them every single time and you're advocating to make sure that we see representation. And when I talk about impact being little things at a time, these are the things that you can be doing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like actually Absolutely. taking a survey after a conference and speaking up and making sure we have more diverse voices on stages for the following year, even if it's one. You have made even if it's difference. one. Yeah, even if right? it's one and, and everybody should be doing that. Right. And then taking a look at who's on the agenda before they even sign up and contacting the folks and say, hey, yeah. I see you don't have anyone. Is there is there room on the panel for a woman? Right. Right. And I think it so makes a difference. Advocacy. I think it it just means so much. And it's something that we all, if we all do it, we can move the needle faster, right? Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. what do you think the future holds for you? Oh, I'm going to be in supply chain forever. Um, <laughs> retirement's not in the future. Um, but when I do, if I do, when I do, I really want to um, focus my energy on paying it forward. Um, I'm involved in a lot already right now but when i have more time i think there's some more amazing organizations that need supply chain professionals uh, given the nature of what they're doing red cross united way allen they all need supply chain expertise and i'd love to continue with that i'm very active um, on a lot of local boards um, i'm really big into stem and school systems and bringing up that next generation of um, STEM, I, my poor daughter, I would drag her to NASA Ames Science Fair so all the time. It was crazy. I'm sure she loved it. <laughs> she did. She actually did. And she's in, in, in a STEM field, so it's fine. <laughs> oh, awesome. But again, it's, it's advocating for the next generation and, and making sure everyone has a seat at the table. It's super, super important, especially with, you know, mentorship and, and guiding and mm -hmm. you got to pay it forward. I've, I've lived a blessed life. I I'm fortunate that I get to do what I love every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important, important to pay that forward. I love that. Well, we talk a lot on the show about the long and winding roads that lead people to supply chain the crazy career pivots and moments of self-discovery. But it's so refreshing to also put the spotlight, spot, the spotlight, the spotlight onto women who have found environments that suit them, that have climbed the ladder and carved out incredible careers for themselves within those environments. When we talk about opening up the industry to women, showing them what their options could look like, it's so important to demonstrate all those possible pathways and the incredible results they could achieve from following them. So did you, did you have a guess at today's big question? At the top of the show, I asked you, what percentage of executive and C-suite roles are now filled by women? Well, it's 26%, an all-time high, and up from 19% in 2022. The same report by Gartner also found that women now make up 41% of the supply chain workforce, up from 39% in 2022. But that frontline representation continues to lag behind with women filling just 31% of these roles. So while we have done an incredible job, there's still some work to do. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us today and for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me and let's get those numbers much higher. We can do it.